Shadow Talk. A bumper edition of Shadow Talk this week, as a new spam campaign is detected delivering a recent vulnerability in Adobe Flash. Memcache servers used in DDoS attacks. Users lose trust to go in HTTPS certificates as news emerges that 23,000 certificates to be rendered useless. And we'll provide an overview of ransomware variants, SamSam, and DataKeeper. And joining me this week, we have Harry Agroon. Hi, Mike. Hello. Uh, we have Raphael Amada. Hey, Mike. How's it going? Yeah, very good. Thank you. And we have Simon and Tame as well. It's a return to the pod for the Tame. It's good to be back, Mike. Thank you. How are you, you guys in London coping with the snow? Uh, you know, we're not, we're not feeling too snowed under, um, but it's a bit chilly. Like always in, in England, slightest bit of snow and everything comes to a standstill. Um, but not awesome. Digital Shadows research. Research must go on. Let's begin then by talking about a newer vulnerability in Adobe Flash, TV 2018-4878. Last week we did talk about APT 37 and, and Reaper. And this is one of those vulnerabilities that was reported to be exploited as part of that campaign. This vulnerability has been exploited in the world since January this year. But this week it has been used in spam campaigns. So this is a really interesting example of how vulnerability exploits can be picked up by different types of malicious activity. So this vulnerability, as you mentioned, was first detected on the 31st of January by a South Korean set, and they said it was exploited in the wild. A couple of days later, it emerged to being targeted since late last year as a zero day by group track tracked as one, two, three. I spoke a little bit about this activity in the last podcast that I was on. Um, about a week after that, a public proof of concept exploit code became available um, and that exploit code was quite similar to the one used in this uh, campaign, the spam campaign. So this campaign used uh, shortened Google links that were considered uh, delivered to victims by email. This was pretty considerate of the actor. Those types of links have some great analytics behind them. It's going to give us some really good insight into the campaign. So there was a sample of five shortened links associated with this spam. Uh, seen around 800 people had clicked on these, which took them to a site where a Lua document was downloaded. Uh, this is a weaponized Microsoft Word document. If this was open, then there was an attempt to exploit the vulnerability. So the affected geographies are pretty broad. Um, that supported that it was a spam campaign, although we don't really know from what the actual intent of the threat actors was because there wasn't much insight into any kind of second stage payload or further activity. So I guess really the key point from this uh, kind of incorporation of this vulnerability into a spam campaign is that easily exploitable, exploitable vulnerabilities are very useful for all types of malicious activity um, due to the potential access that some of them offer and they're not just limited to a, a nation state or any specific actor. Yeah, that's, that's quite interesting how, how quickly it moves from being kind of the preserve of an APT to being exploited by a wider group of cyber criminals. It seems like a two month period really from being exploited in the wild to, to being incorporated in this spam campaign. Is that pretty typical? Yeah, I guess it was a little bit quicker than two months and certainly we have seen this before. So for example, the Microsoft Word uh, vulnerability 2017-1-2 was incorporated into malicious activity within, within a week of the public proof of concepts and we've definitely seen exploits picked up in as little as two days. So uh, we did some reporting around this in a couple of years ago really. So when the hacking team was compromised, some of those exploits were integrated into exploit kits within that time frame. Also, what's quite interesting about uh, this Adobe Flash vulnerability, there was some chat overnight on Twitter suggesting that this CBA was exploited by Lazarus, and it is possible that they have, but then again, it could be picked up by really anybody now. So I think we'll see it used by lots of different groups over the short term at least, um, and it does also suggest that threat actors continue to see Adobe Flash as a valuable target. Yeah. There's quite funny responses <laughs> on that thread about um, yeah. the quick attribution to Lazarus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's kind of... If everything is Lazarus, is anything Lazarus? So yeah. that remains to be seen. We're all Lazarus. <laughs> yeah. is, in terms of CVE 2018 48 78, is there anything particularly exciting about this, this vulnerability? Yeah, I feel like uh, the vulnerability exploit hype guy right now. So <laughs> yeah, we have remote code execution, a public POC. It was just patched. So that takes time for people to implement as well. Um, we've definitely picked up discussions around this on forums. 
um, by various individuals as well. So showing there is some interest, although don't want to assume too much around that. They could all be security researchers, I'm not sure. Um, so I'm going to think you had some thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I suppose in term, when you look at this kind of vulnerability um, and the value of it, um, and think about it in the way of what do, what do the bad guys want, then we can use that to provide some indication of what's going to become popular. So we've done a lot of reporting on the sort of MS Office vulnerabilities that have been exploited in the past few weeks as well. So if you think about a sort of recipe for a good exploit is it grants you an initial foothold on the network when you exploit it. So it's remote code execution, um, affecting widely used software or services. So it's not specific to one circumstance. You know, you could develop a zero day exploit for a specific router against the target. But, you know, if you want something that's going to be reusable, or that's widely applicable, then stuff like Adobe Flash or Microsoft Office vulnerabilities are great. And it doesn't require any sort of unique circumstances for you to exploit. So you don't have to have a position of privilege within a network already. It's just something that you can fire off and it's done. So I think those are really good indicators to keep in mind. And especially for um, network defense when it comes to vulnerability management, if you think about those kind of indicators, what's coming up, then that can probably help you to prioritize a little bit as well. Obviously, that's easier in theory than it is in practice, but still quite interesting, I think. Great stuff. All useful advice for prioritizing your patching there. On to the second story of the week. There's been a pretty public fallout between Trustigo, a reset of HTTPS certificates, and the certificate providers themselves. Could this be pretty significant for the organizations that are using these certificates? So I think we should start by setting the scene because there's quite a lot that's gone on here. It's still quite unclear exactly what's happened. So we've got two companies at the center of the controversy. We've got DigiCert and Trustigo. And it's safe to say certainty and trust aren't really words that come to mind following everything that's happened this week. <laughs> but first, we've got Trustico. So they're a reseller that sells certs on the semantics umbrella. So other organizations like GeoTrust, Thor, RapidSSL, they will fall under that, that bracket as well. Um, and that umbrella was recently acquired from Trustico as now operated by a company called DigiCert. Now, Trustico cut ties with DigiCert in February because they're going to be working with another cert provider called Komodo. And then on top of that, part of the background is that in July last year, Google announced that it would no longer deem semantic branded certs as trustworthy in 2018 because of previous security issues. So what's happened this week? Well, the news is that around 23,000 semantic issued HTTPS website certs are going to be revoked because their associated private keys had been exposed. Now, there's conflicting stories as to why this happened. So Trustico claims that it contacted DigiCert to request that the certs be revoked. Given Google's announcement last year, they were worried about it, and they thought that there had been basically a compromise there. However, DigiCert claimed that what happened in reality was Trustico had contacted them via email, claiming that the certs had been compromised. But in the email itself, they provided evidence of the exposed keys. Now, that's significant because under industry standards, resellers aren't actually allowed to retain copies of private keys. So what DigiCert are claiming is that Trustico's actions triggered an automatic security response, which then meant that DigiCert had to revoke all the certs. So as you can see, both sides are kind of blaming each other here. But for our listeners, the bottom line really here is that this will likely lead to many websites being taken down unless the owners replace those certs soon. Uh, the affected customers have apparently all been notified by DigiCert, who are responsible for revoking the certificates and Trustico as well, and they're both offering free replacements to anyone who's been affected. So you should know if you're one of the affected organizations. In the long term, this is probably going to cause reputational damage to both DigiCert and Trustico as they provide a conflicting reporting. They're having a very public spat. But in terms of the cert system as a whole, that's, that's probably still going to stay in place. It's not going to damage that that much in the long term. Yeah, and obviously for the organizations that do have one of those 23,000 certificates, there's an obvious concern for those. Does this story kind of talk to the broader risks around being convinced that kind of a certificate or a website is secure because it's got a certificate on it? Um, should we be talk about that briefly? Yeah, sure. So most people are brought up to believe that when you visit an HTTPS page, uh, the site, the connection is secure because it's using SSL or TLS encryption. So a website will present a browser with that certificate to show that the public key has been authenticated by the certificate authority, which is why you see the padlock in the corner of the browser. But having that legitimate certificate doesn't in reality mean that the site is necessarily secure. 
what it's doing is basically validating that the site you visit is the actual website and the communications to that site are secure. But as we've seen in the past, certificate authorities have sometimes issued fake certificates both to governments, but also sometimes criminals have managed to steal legitimate certificates and then incorporate them into their attacks. So what we have here is if the system relies on certificate authorities being trusted entities and then that trust is somewhat broken, it kind of undermines the entire model behind it. So we've got around 12,000 recognized certificate authorities. That's a lot of targets if a cyber criminal wanted to try and uh, steal some legitimate certificate, certificates from them. And also a lot of opportunity for a few bad eggs. So all in all, I think the advice here is that HTTPS is definitely necessary, but it's not sufficient. You can't just fully trust it. You need additional control. So two-factor authentication, for example, would be one in that case. I think this is quite an interesting one as well, because we have seen different groups using certificate um, services like Let's Encrypt, for example, um, for their websites that they're using on those domains to basically add credibility to those campaigns and people just click on them, see the padlock and assume that it's a safe uh, domain to visit. Yeah, it's a great point. It's something that we saw when we were looking at the online carding course that we did some research on uh, in 2017. And that was certainly a piece of advice for those kind of trying to sell their carded goods and get mules to be involved. It's very much use one of these fake certificates to legitimize your website. And they were saying it worked an absolute treat. So do watch out for that. Now, Raf, last week you did chasten me for underplaying ransomware and its impact on having organizations. So I'm going to give you the floor now to just speak about any updates you will on ransomware. It's Raf's ransomware corner. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you've learned your lesson. <laughs> <laughs> we threatened to relegate you to the bench this week. So um, no, I'm glad you're still leading the pod. Um, so yeah, so we talked about Samstam last week, how um, the Colorado Dep Department of Transport had apparently been affected by a Samstam infection. So there's a bit more reporting on that. It's a bit clearer what's gone on. There's still some things we're not sure of, some quite big things actually. But just a quick rundown. So over 2,000 computers were intentionally shut down by the Department of Transport. And only employee systems running Windows OS with McAfee antivirus installed were apparently impacted. Crucial systems, such as those used for road management, traffic surveillance, they apparently were unaffected. What we don't know, the big question still is how, how the infection happened. What was the attack vector? So Sam Sam has previously used RDP. There's been rumors online of apparently FTP servers with exposed passwords being found online, but it's unknown if that was actually the way this attack was achieved. Also, we... We have a bit of info in terms of attribution to Samstam from previous attacks. It's Again, we still can't be clear as to who was behind this one, whether Samstam is, is in the hands of multiple groups. But Samstam has previously been attributed to a threat group called Gold Lao, and that's either a, a singular threat group or a variety of actors who kind of work closely together. And they generally scan, they use what's called like a scan and exploit technique. So they'll target vulnerable software apps like JBoss or RDP, like I said earlier. So that's all from Raf's ransomware corner. Actually, there's more, Mike. So <laughs> as well as SamSam, there's another ransomware as a service variant. So I talked about ransomware as a service last week, about the pros and cons of it, why it's very attractive for cyber criminals. So this week we've got DataKeeper, which is the name of the new ransomware as a service variant. High level, what's, what's significant about this or what's new about it? So it can conduct lateral movement, which not too many ransomware as a service variants uh, are offering at this stage and also um, it's free to sign up like a lot of other offerings at the minute there's one single bitcoin wallet that we've seen associated with it in the last time our analysts checked on it there have been no transactions at present but given that it apparently can conduct lateral movement uh, it's free to sign up and also just the general ransomware as a service business model we're probably going to see some people trying to use this in the near future so it is quite an attractive offering for cyber criminals it's funny because Data Keeper sounds more like a security product than a, than a ransomware, but there you go. I have a positive uh, ransomware as a service update as well. So uh, the Romanian police in Europol just released a free decryption service for GANCRAB, which was a ransomware as a service variant that's been really aggressively uh, used within the last two months. I think there was over 50,000 infections of that. So that's the good news oh, story right. from this week. That ransomware service is feeling the pinch from law enforcement. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's always a pleasure to have you back, Simon Tame. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And let's stay with you as we go on to the final news story of the week. And that's memcache servers being used for DDoS reflection attacks. Yeah, thanks, Mike. So, so this is a tale of bad configuration, nasty packets, and a pretty hideous reflection. And for once, I'm not talking about myself. So the bottom line here is that the internet-facing service servers running uh, memcache, which is a memory caching system used to manage database loads in general, they're being used to conduct uh, distributed denial of surface reflection attacks. So we've already seen this on the 28th of Feb, uh, the code repository GitHub was hit and the attack there reached a peak volume of 1.35 terabits per second, biggest, which is sort biggest of- Biggest ever. So that, yeah, that's the biggest ever. So we saw you know, very high volumes from Mirai, uh, which affected the website hosting company OVH in September. But yeah, this is this is the biggest we know of. Um, so while that attack volume was so large, GitHub only had intermittent website accessibility issues, and that, that lasted for about 10 minutes. So they moved all the traffic to Akamai, who helped to mitigate that. So that was quite a speedy response from them. But there's a few sort of interesting details to pick out here with the memcache stuff in general. So they have UDP port 11211 open by default. So as soon as they're sort of facing the internet, as soon as they're listening to external conne um, connections, they're listening on that port unless the admins have changed them. So that means that attackers can send UDP requests, UDP being the protocol, to the server with a spoofed IP address. And then the responses from that server will go back to the spoofed, in this case, the target's IP address with a much larger packet size. So the attack depends on um, these memcache servers being internet facing, using default configuration and without any traffic filtering. So no firewalls and no access control lists. So reflection attacks have been around for a while. So you can use NTP protocol, for example. But the thing with memcache attacks is they're much bigger than normal in terms of the uh, bandwidth amplification factor. So NTP is the next highest in terms of this amplification factor, and that's around 550. But with memcached, it's reported at up to 51,200. So that's, that's pretty large. And it means that attackers can achieve higher volume DDoS attacks with less resource requirements on their end. So one of the things we don't know in the GitHub example, which is probably the biggest one that we've seen, is who launched it and why. Um, because it actually, if you think of the impact, that was quite ineffective. Yes, GitHub had to respond quite quickly, but it shows a lack of planning maybe. And, Either someone was messing around or they hadn't fully considered what the response from GitHub was going to be. But yeah, that's quite a sort of interesting intelligence gap at the moment. What was the motivations behind Dyn and the attacks against that a couple of years back? So from memory, this, is, this was just kind of testing capability, messing around. I think it was linked to script kids. Um, there wasn't any sort of financial motivation or anything else um, with that one. So yeah, I think it was just sort of playing around, seeing what they could do. Yeah. And um, what are the kind of broader differences between this and Mirai? Obviously, both pretty big, but mm. more to it than that. Yeah. So it's something like uh, the Mirai attacks that depended on the operator of the botnet having sort of thousands of enslaved devices to achieve the volumes that we saw. Um, so if you take the Krebs on security attack that happened in September 2016, I think the botnet used there... Um, had an estimated number of you know, 100,000, maybe even closer to 150,000 devices. So with the memcache stuff, it's because of the amplification factor that we're, we're seeing such high attack volumes, which is likely to mean that the attackers need less devices on their end overall. So you still need the devices probably to uh, sort of spoof the IP addresses and send the requests from, but they'll need a lot less um, in comparison to something like Mirai, which is dependent on IoT devices, or at least it was at the time. So yeah, there's, I suppose there's quite a few differences there in terms of resourcing on the attacker's side. Great. And do we know how many of these servers are exposed online? How big is yeah, it? So it? Sorry, it's, a, it's estimated anywhere between 88,000 to 100,000. Um, that was sort of on the 28th of February as well. So whether that's gone up or down, we don't know. Um, but that's just servers that are listening on port 11211. So they could be potentially used in memcached attacks. Uh, I guess it remains to be seen if the reporting pressure or um, you know, all the reporting around these attacks will have any impact on the number of servers that are actually exposed. I know there's been a lot of criticisms of people and organizations that are actually running with these servers, uh, listening on the internet on that port because of the implications of it. Uh, but it, yeah, whether that changes anything, whether these servers get taken offline um, in light of big attacks such as the one affecting GitHub, that remains to be seen. Okay, I think it's maybe timely to have our key takeaways from each of you. Tane, perhaps you've got a, a key takeaway regarding the memcache servers. What can people be doing 
about this? Yeah, so if you are operating internet-facing servers using Memcache, then you can do a few things. So change its configuration being one of them so that it's not internet-facing. Or you can block or filter connections on UDP port 11211 uh, using firewalls or access control lists. I'm sure the security community would be very grateful if you did. Um, in the meantime, it's not likely that this problem is going away. So uh, in the short term, keep listening out for more updates, just not on port 11211. And from Harriet, what have we got from you? So my takeaway this week is about knowing and contextualizing the uh, threat landscape. So the Adobe Flash exploit this week, it's used in a spam campaign that shows that even though you may not be affected by a targeted espionage activity coming from a nation state actor, you still might be inadvertently affected by a spam campaign. So if you have an external facing asset with a vulnerability that's been exploited in the wild and has a public PSC, it should be prioritized in your patching management. So for me, it's a reminder about certificate validation. So from mid-April, Chrome browsers using, or Chrome browser users visiting websites using a certificate from Symantec, which is issued before June 2016 or after December 2017, will be warned that their connections are not private and someone may be trying to steal their information. I think most of us have seen those sort of warning messages on surfing online. So users will have to basically click past that warning in order to get to the website. So that can obviously be a big headache for a lot of companies. Obviously, not everyone is using Chrome, but you also don't want visitors to your site, customers seeing that when they try and, they try and visit. It will damage trust in your site um, and also potentially impact business as well. If someone wants to buy something, if you're a retailer, for example, and then sees that, they're not going to click through. So if in doubt, check your search root certificate authority to see if it's semantic or not, and then take the necessary action from there. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you to you all. Have a great weekend and a great week. Thank you for listening to this week's edition of Shadow Talk. For further research from Digital Shadows research team, visit resources.digitalshadows.com.